Today, I want to introduce our colleague, Adrian Keller, who um, we're so thankful uh, agreed to our invitation to come and speak to everyone today uh, as part of the Adaptation Planning and Practices training. So I will let Adrian introduce herself and take it from there. Thank you, Adrian. Awesome. Thanks, Danielle. Um, it's great to be here. I'm excited to talk a little bit about how carbon management fits into a climate adaptation lens. So again, my name is Adrian Keller. I'm a research assistant professor um, at Michigan Tech University and work with these folks um, at the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science. Um, so I'll run through this. If you have pressing questions, um, feel free to, um, to ask, put it in the chat, um, but we will have a Q&A at the end. Um, and I'm available for follow-up questions down the road. So there's my email if you wanna be in touch. All right, now we gotta proceed. There we go. All right, so um, the outline for today, I wanna first sort of set the stage and talk about why there is interest and increasing interest in managing forests and other ecosystems for carbon. Sort of put this in perspective. Um, talk about how carbon cycles through a forest, um, and I'll use forests as sort of the, the model ecosystem, but the basic carbon cycle applies to other terrestrial ecosystems as well. Talk about um, how forest management affects carbon cycling, and then how we can consider the trade-offs and co-benefits that are inherent to managing for multiple goals. And I'm going to focus on managing for carbon alongside other goals while using a case study that I've worked on actually in um, oak savannas in Wisconsin. So that's where we're going today. So I want to start by putting forest carbon management into perspective and thinking about the global carbon budget. So there's this increasing interest that I suspect many of you are aware of um, in thinking about how we can maintain and increase the land sink to further draw down um, atmospheric CO2 and mitigate climate change. And so this fact figure on the left shows how fossil fuels um, have contributed to rising atmospheric CO2 concentrations over time. So this is from the Global Carbon Project. If you're not familiar with them, I would encourage you to check it out. They have some really great resources that are very um, accessible and some really great infographics. So here on the um, x-axis, we have time. So since sort of pre-industrialization. Um, and then we have um, atmospheric CO2 and on the y-axis. And so we can see that over time, land use change in the sort of weird yellow color. Um, has has contributed to atmospheric CO2, but really our fossil fuel emissions have risen dramatically, particularly over recent decades to contribute to atmospheric CO2. And so we see in blue below how atmospheric CO2 has been increasing. Um, but we have this important land sink, which is what we're gonna focus on today, as well as an ocean sink that has absorbed some of those increasing fossil fuel emissions and emissions from land use change. And so this figure on the right shows the same thing, but in a slightly different way. So if we have our atmospheric um, carbon dioxide uh, concentrations in 1850 that were uh, um, 286 ppm in 1850, and if we look at um, just a couple of years ago, it's even higher today, we have 415 ppm or parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And a lot of this change from um, 286 to 415 is due to, again, these fossil fuel emissions of coal, oil, and gas, as well as cement, and um, land use change. And a lot of this is converting forests and wetlands into um, agricultural and development land. But um, without this land sink and this ocean sink, our atmospheric CO2 levels would be way higher. They'd be almost at 600 ppm today. And so there's a lot of interest in thinking about um, how can we maintain and increase this land sink to help mitigate climate change. And so the, the important thing to keep in mind here when we're moving forward and we're thinking about how can we use small parcels of land to address um, the climate crisis, to really remember that fossil fuel emissions largely, they pale in, um, the, the land sink pales in comparison to um, what emissions are coming from fossil fuels and land use change. And our land sink is really important, right? So here it's drawing down almost 100 ppm of CO2, parts per million of CO2. But our capacity to increase that land sink is fairly minimal. Our capacity to decrease that land sink, as you see in this land use change, um, 
uh, bar right here is quite big. So if we scale down to um, the, the national level, so that was global. And here we look at data from the US in the second state of the carbon cycle report, which is now um, a decade old, but your patterns are gonna be similar um, in current day. So here we have teragrams of carbon. So how much carbon is stored in the US in forest biomass, um, grassland biomass and terrestrial wetland biomass. So those are the green bars. And then there's a significant amount of carbon that's stored not in our biomass, but in our soils. So our forest soils, our agricultural soils, um, grasslands and wetlands. So we can see that um, our forests are really important, um, both in terms of how much um, tree biomass they have, but also in carbon storage below ground in their soils. And so this is carbon stocks in the US. And then we can look at carbon fluxes. So um, here on the y-axis, we have how much carbon is moving, um, in this case, from the land to the atmosphere is a positive number. Um, and how much carbon is moving from the atmosphere into the land is a negative number. So forests do a really good job of moving uh, carbon from the atmosphere into the land, um, as well as terrestrial wetlands and other land uses. But again, fossil fuels really, unfortunately, win the game here, and they're contributing um, an order of magnitude more carbon to the atmosphere than our forests are able to pull down. And so again, I want to emphasize that the carbon cycle is just that. It's a carbon cycle. And there's this natural process whereby um, growing forests are removing carbon from the atmosphere, pulling it down into their biomass, into their soils. And then over time, through decomposition, as well as disturbance and fires, that carbon is released back into the atmosphere. Um, and when we talk about forest management, whether managing for harvested wood products, um, bioenergy, we are um, altering slightly this carbon cycle um, while we're pulling thing, we'll, we'll, we are pulling um, biomass from, from our forests and in some cases converting it into energy, energy, which is gonna be released back into the atmosphere. In some cases, we're storing that carbon in these harvested wood products for quite a long period of time. So if you think about um, you know, the table that maybe has been passed down through generations in your family, that carbon is still being um, held and withheld from the atmosphere. It's still being held in that table. Um, and until that table goes into the landfill and fill and becomes decomposed, it's not contributing to um, CO2 emissions and climate change. <clears throat> All right, so if we're now trying to scale down onto our specific site or our project and think about how does carbon cycle, <coughs> excuse me, I've been trying to get over this cold for like two months now. Um, how carbon cycles through your, your uh, forest. Again, we have this atmospheric carbon dioxide pool and we have our ecosystem carbon pool. And the amount of carbon that moves from the atmosphere to that ecosystem carbon pool is um, what we call carbon uptake or carbon sequestration. And that's the movement or the process by which plants take up atmospheric carbon dioxide and convert it into biomass. So it's a flux, it's a process. <coughs> and then the amount of carbon that's stored in the ecosystem is what we call carbon storage. And that's a stock of carbon or the amount of carbon that's retained in a pool. So carbon uptake or sequestration is a flux. Um, carbon storage is a stock and the amount of carbon that's retained in a pool at any given time. And then again, it's a cycle. And so over time, the carbon that is stored in the ecosystem is going to be emitted back into the atmosphere. So to evaluate and to predict where and for how long carbon is stored in your ecosystem, it's helpful to break this big box of ecosystem carbon into smaller pools. And so a lot of us are familiar with the live above ground carbon pool. That's what we tend to manage most for. Um, and that's where carbon is initially moving from the atmosphere into the ecosystem carbon pool right through photosynthesis. But once um, those tissues have photosynthesized and we've increased our carbon pool in the live above ground carbon pool, that carbon can then move into below ground tissues like roots and mycorrhizal fungi. Some of that is going to move eventually into dead wood carbon, stand, both standing and downed woody debris, as well as into your forest floor carbon or your litter layer, depending on what ecosystem you're in. 
And some of that carbon is eventually going to move into your soil pools, which, as we mentioned before, are quite important for and quite large um, in many ecosystems, particularly forests and grasslands. Um, but what I um, just showed is all those pools being of equal size, but they're, they're not. And this is just an example from an Eastern hardwood forest. This, these percentages are gonna vary depending on your site, even within a site they can vary, but this is just to represent um, the idea that these pools vary in their relative sizes. And so in this case, um, your soil carbon pool is the largest of these different pools and your live above ground pool is second largest. And so it's important to consider Number one, how the relative size of these different carbon pools, and then also how um, quickly carbon moves into and out of these pools, or their what you might call mean residence time. And so our live above ground and below ground carbon pools, as well as our deadwood carbon pools, tend to cycle around years to decades. So carbon will stick around in those pools for approximately years to decades. We contrast this with our forest floor carbon. Um, that carbon cycles much more quickly. So that carbon tends to stick around only for weeks to years. And of course, this depends um, a lot on site conditions and climate, um, but this is just rough approximations. And um, a lot of you probably have great insight into the, um, the rate at which carbon cycles in your exact site. And then if we think about soil carbon, which again is the largest pool um, in many systems, including in this example of Eastern hardwood forest, soil carbon sticks around for much longer, decades to centuries or even longer. Um, but we often as managers and natural resource professionals, we think about this alive ground, live above ground carbon pool the most. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it's what we can see, it's the easiest to measure. Um, but it's also what we most manage for, right? When we're thinking about different ways to do um, selective harvests or um, to do different management techniques, they tend to be focused around this live above ground carbon pool. Um, and also this live above ground carbon pool, because it cycles from years to decades, it's changing at management relevant timescales. And if you contrast that with your soil carbon pool that cycles quite slowly, there's a little capacity to increase your soil carbon pool over management relevant timescales. So you might have a management project that you're implementing um, today and hoping to um, monitor changes by 2030. You can see pretty significant changes in live above ground carbon over that timescale, um, but you're gonna see, it's gonna be hard to detect and um, you're not gonna find significant changes in the soil carbon pool um, in most cases by 2030. Um, the one exception would be if you do some, you can decrease that soil carbon pool um, significantly by doing, by you know, losing your topsoil, for example. All right, so now I want to talk about what influences carbon cycling in a forest. And we're going to walk through a couple of different site characteristics that can influence how carbon cycles through a forest. And you might um, apply this to thinking about your own site. And, and these site characteristics really pertain to ecosystems beyond forests as well. Um, so we're going to talk through these site characteristics, and then we're going to consider how management as well as disturbance um, interact with each other to drive carbon cycling in, in our ecosystems. So let's first focus on stand age. So there's been a lot of um, discussion um, amongst managers and people, folks in the public that are really concerned about the climate crisis, about how stand age influences the ability of a forest to um, take up and hold carbon. And so here are some really nice data from Hoover and Smith 2023. These are from um, FIA plots across Northeastern forests in the US. And here we see um, the, the bars in, in light gray. Those are the rates of the rates of carbon uptake or carbon sequestration over time. And so we see these really young age classes, um, these young forests are able to take up carbon quite quickly and quite a lot of carbon. But that's contrasted with the stock or the amount of carbon that's stored in each of these age classes. And that's shown by the triangles. Um, and you can see that our um, older age classes, while they're not taking up carbon as quickly, they're storing a lot more carbon than our younger age classes. And so the take home here is that young stands have higher rates of carbon uptake or carbon sequestration, 
while older stands have big bigger biomass carbon stocks. And so there's a trade-off between how much carbon you're taking up and how much you're storing. And the tree species composition is also really important. Um, and so here, the first thing that you might take from this slide, so we have um, stand age on the y or on the x-axis, and then we have net primary productivity. And this is a proxy for how much carbon is being taken up by, by these forests. And so the first thing is that you can see all these different lines, which are different forest types or tree species compositions. They all have a general same trend where your net primary productivity, how much carbon you're taking up from the atmosphere um, tends to increase pretty significantly over the early stand, a stand ages. And then as your forests get older, it tends to sort of taper off. Those older stands are still taking up um, carbon. They're still being productive, but at a lower rate than um, maybe when they were 20 to 60 years old. But you can see that these um, different tree species compositions do vary in um, how much net primary productivity they're realizing. Um, and so you can see these loblolly, um, pine, loblolly and shortleaf pine um, community plant communities are have quite... Um, high MPP, they're very productive, but they're taking up a lot of carbon. And you can contrast that to perhaps the aspen birch purple line. And so tree species composition, in addition to stand age, is, um, is quite important in influencing um, carbon cycling in a forest. So again, net primary productivity varies with stand age and other site factors, such as tree species composition. Um, and here is a nice study from a pine stocking, um, a pine stocking study in Missouri that shows um, here on the left how thinning increases tree level carbon. So here we have um, different levels of thinning, so our control is in the um, filled in circles, um, and we see that um, the control has the lowest amount of carbon storage in a given tree compared to these thinning treatments whether it's thinning at low, medium, or high density, okay? And so if you thin, you're able to grow fewer, but bigger trees, right? Because there's more light, there's more nutrients, there's more soil space um, to support the fewer trees that do exist. But if you contrast that with stand level carbon storage, you actually see the opposite result where the controls are able to hold more carbon in at the stand level compared to these thinning treatments. And so this, there's sort of two take homes here is number one, it's really important when we're communicating about carbon management to be clear on what scale we're talking about. Are we talking about the scale of a tree? Are we talking about the scale of a stand? Are we talking about landscape scale, regional scale? Um, so being really clear on that, because as you can see here, if you're talking about tree level versus stand level, you actually have an opposite result. And the second message is that you can either have a few big trees or you can have many small trees. And in most cases, you're going to have a similar carbon output um, and carbon story at the um, project or the, the site level. All right, and then here I think we can just show in pictures the idea that oftentimes low structural diversity lends itself to lower carbon storage compared to high structural diversity. And a lot of that is due to just, as you can see in this high structural diversity photo, that there is more vegetation occupying more different niches within that the same space compared to this low structural diversity where you really only have biomass in, um, in a few places on that plot, right? Um, and so this isn't always true, but in general, higher structural diversity lends itself to higher carbon uptake and carbon storage in a forest. And soil properties are also really important in dictating the productivity um, and the carbon uptake and storage in a system. And so here we have a study from Luke Nave and others in 2017 in the upper um, Midwest that showed shows how um, above ground bi biomass, which is a proxy for um, how much carbon is stored above ground. So biomass is about 50% carbon. So anytime you're thinking about biomass, cut it in half and you're, you're talking about carbon. And so here we see in the um, uh, sorry, in these green points, these moraine sites, um, they're these really, um, these really sandy loam soils that have good soil organic matter, they have high water holding capacity, good cation exchange capacity. 
So th these soils that are really fertile are able to support more above ground biomass compared to the outwash plain um, and the lake margin terrace that have a much lower soil organic matter um, cation exchange capacity um, are not able to support as much productivity and therefore are not able to sequester and store as much carbon. So soil properties um, and soil fertility really matter um, in terms of carbon cycling in a forest or in other ecosystems. And finally, climate. So from the same study, um, here we, sh we see um, median biomass production rate. So again, you can just think about this, the rate of carbon that's being taken up by these forests per year. And so um, higher or um, more red colors are more productive compared to the blue colors. And so you can see if you um, know this region at all, that you're getting more productivity in the warmer climates on the lower right hand side of this figure versus if you look at northern Minnesota, which has um, quite cold winters, um, although they're becoming less cold as um, climate change progresses, you have much less um, productivity in those systems because of the climate, in part because of the climate. And so these site characteristics are really important in dictating carbon cycling, um, but that this also interacts with management and disturbance. And so there's a nice study that comes out of um, the Harvard Forest by Adrian Finzi and others from 2020 that shows this interaction um, and the importance of both management and disturbance. So here we have an oak dominated site and we can see over time that our net ecosystem production, just the um, exchange of carbon, um, from the atmosphere onto land. So here, uh, a positive number means that there's um, more carbon moving from the atmosphere to, to land. And a negative number means that the ecosystem is emitting carbon back into the atmosphere. So this oak maple dominated sand in red, you can see that it's um, got relatively high net ecosystem production. Um, it's sequestering carbon uh, over time and it varies a little bit, right, um, year to year. And this hemlock dominated stand in blue is showing the same um, same pattern until around, um, I guess, 2013, it gets hit by the um, a disturbance by um, the woolly delgid that really knocked out these hemlock stands. And so quite quickly, these hemlock stands went from being um, quite productive to actually emitting carbon into the atmosphere. And then if you look at this clear cut where it, this clear cut was um, emitting carbon into the atmosphere, but actually quite quickly over, you know, really just a couple of years, it was able to um, build up a biomass and actually start sequestering carbon and being um, a net gain for, um, for climate and moving more carbon from the atmosphere into the, into the ecosystem. All right, and so this leads us to reminding ourselves that it's really important to consider climate and disturbance risk when we're thinking about how carbon management influences our, our ecosystems and our carbon goals. So if we take a, a forest that we're passively managing, this is the upper panel, and in a low risk outcome, you might see some changes in plant composition, um, but it's not gonna vary that much between the passive and the active management um, scenarios. But then if you compare the um, panel on the above right to the panel on the below right, we see a big difference between our passive management and our active management scenarios, where if you have a high risk outcome, passive management, you're gonna have a lot of losses um, of species composition and of carbon. You just see less biomass, right, in this upper right compared to this actively managed forest that you are gonna have some um, death, you're gonna have, um, some losses of carbon, but they're going to be much less in this actively managed um, stand compared to the passively managed stand because you are able to help to a certain degree mitigate this climate and disturbance risk. And so uh, I think an important message to to sort of keep in mind when we're thinking about carbon management um, is that a change in management may produce a short-term loss in carbon but this can promote carbon gains over the long term due to reduced risk of mortality and lost productivity or major disturbance. And so I wanna give a couple of examples of management effects on forest carbon. And I'll start with um, an example from an Aspen 
site in the upper Great Lakes. <laughs> and so the management um, action here was clear cutting the whole tree at these three different sites in the uh, upper Great Lakes. And the first thing that I'll point out is that we've already talked about how carbon is stored in these different carbon pools, right? And so here they measured these different carbon pools, above ground biomass, woody debris, forest floor, and soil. So I want you to sort of look at the, these figures and there's a couple of different takeaways. Number one, we can see as we talked about earlier that the relative proportion of carbon that's in these different pools varies within a site. And it also varies between sites. And so you can see that the percentage of ecosystem carbon that's stored in above ground biomass varies between these different sites, right? So in the top um, panel, Ottawa, 38% of carbon is stored in above ground biomass. And that's quite different than Pike Bay, which stores about 62% of carbon in the above ground biomass. And then this is showing how the clear cut management affects these different pools. And so you can see where the, um, the, management starts around um well it varies in in different um in different sites but you can see where the above ground biomass pool drops to zero that's the clear cut and then you can see how it rebounds uh, over time so there are a couple takeaways from this that number one um of course the clear cutting is going to affect your above ground biomass pool but harvest did not affect soil carbon significantly at any of these sites um and that while above ground biomass is affected by the harvest, that at all these sites, the above ground biomass pool begins to recover within a decade. And so it's relatively quickly, um, quick recovery of that pool. And again, the sites vary in the proportion of carbon that's in the above ground biomass pool. And therefore um, sites are gonna vary in how management is gonna affect their total ecosystem pool, right? So Ottawa, their ecosystem carbon, um, their above ground biomass doesn't make up as a big a percentage of their ecosystem carbon as does Pike Bay. So at Pike Bay, um, your clear cutting is going to have a bigger effect on uh, your ecosystem carbon than at Ottawa. And I'll just note that um, the study also looked at the effects of bowl cutting and they found that dependent um, the, the type of treatment really didn't um, significantly affect the outcomes after a decade. So the effects of bull cutting on biomass carbon did not vary from those of clear cutting eight years post-harvest. And so I'll just give one last example from Northern Hardwoods Forest in Northern Wisconsin. And so at this study, they had a couple of different cutting treatments. So they had a 20 centimeter diameter limit, a shelter wood, single tree selection, um, and an unharvested control. And their research question was looking more long-term. So that prior study that I showed from Aspen's was really looking at sort of shorter term, less than a decade effects of um, clear cutting and other um, harvesting techniques on ecosystem carbon. And this study was looking at more than 50 years post-treatment, how do carbon pools differ across treatments? And again, these are the different treatments that they had. And here we see Again, our tree carbon, so this is your live above ground carbon pool um, and your understory carbon. Note that there are um, differences on, in terms of the magnitude of the y-axis. Um, and so we can see that the control on the far right had a lot more carbon um, in its tree biomass than, um, than some of these other treatments. And so the letters indicate significant difference. So your C shows a significant difference from anything labeled as B or A. And they measured all the, the different pools that we've talked about. So they also measured deadwood carbon, forest floor carbon, and mineral soil carbon. And so we can see that while tree carbon did vary significantly between these different treatments, that there was no significant difference in this mineral soil carbon or in the forest floor carbon um, across the treatments. And then if you put this all together, we see some differences in total ecosystem carbon where um, our control did have higher total ecosystem carbon compared to some, but not all of the cutting treatments. And this is due um, to lower above ground carbon storage in some of these tr um, cutting treatments. And then they also looked at harvested wood carbon and they found that um, there were some differences um, between treatments and how much harvested wood they were able to procure, procure from these treatments. 
and then added them together. So how much carbon did stayed in the ecosystem and how much were they able to harvest um, for harvested wood products? And again, um, there's um, slightly more carbon in your control compared to some, but not all of the um, cutting treatments. And so this is sort of demonstrates this trade-off between keeping carbon in the ecosystem and also trying to provide um, other benefits of your forest, such as harvested wood products. So we've talked a lot about forest carbon cycling um, and how management influences carbon cycling in our ecosystems. And we really, I know you all are thinking about climate adaptation in, um, in this training, and it's really important to put carbon management into context as part of climate adaptation. And so climate adaptation sometimes, but not always, will support carbon management goals. And carbon management goals or climate mitigation goals will sometimes, but not always, align with climate adaptation goals. And I am not expecting you to read this, but I just want to highlight um, that there is a menu of adaptation strategies and approaches that have specifically been developed for forest carbon management. And so I really encourage you to go look at these and sort of think about how you might align some of your carbon management goals with, within a climate adaptation lens. And so um, in sort of that same light, we're often thinking about carbon management as one of many management goals and objectives on our um, on our sites. So we may be interested in early successional bird habitat, outdoor recreation, harvested wood products, cultural connection. And so it's important to to recognize that management is multi-objective, and therefore trade-offs are inherent. And taking a diverse um, considering our diverse objectives trying to manage for diverse forest conditions or for diverse ecosystem conditions can be quite um, beneficial where certain patches of land you might prioritize for certain goals or, and objectives and other um, parcels of land you might prioritize for other um, goals and objectives. And just a reminder that carbon can support or in, sometimes it will conflict with other objectives. So I think that as managers, we're often um, necessarily thinking about these trade-offs and potential co-benefits between these different goals and objectives. Um, but I think the more that we can do it explicitly and intentionally and communicate clearly about what the potential trade-offs and co-benefits are, I think the better we'll do um, in, in our iterative management and able to learn from what we're doing now to, and apply into the future. And so I wanna present um, briefly this case study that I worked on with the Nature Conservancy on the Meyer Preserve in southeastern Wisconsin. And so this is an oak savanna site um, where we identified two management goals. So the first was to maintain and increase savanna dependent plant biodiversity. Um, and the second was to maintain and increase carbon uptake and storage. So I know you all are working through identifying your management goals and objectives and moving through the adaptation workbook. And something that um, we really learned here is that it was really important to be specific about our management goals. So we started off by saying, oh, just maintain and increase biodiversity. But that was a little bit too amorphous and a little bit too big picture. And so really honing in that we were, what we were talking about was savanna dependent plant biodiversity allowed us to, to think more strategically about what some of the trade-offs might be with increasing carbon uptake and storage, and also um, aligned with man, uh, monitoring efforts down the road so that we could learn from this in the future. And so just as you all are doing, we then wanted to ask, what are the climate change vulnerabilities in these ecosystems in southeastern Wisconsin? And so we identified um, that these savanna, oak savannas and woodlands were susceptible to woody encroachment and invasive species, um, to disease, but there is um, a sort of a complicated interaction between disease and climate change. Um, there were both challenges and opportunities for prescribed burns. And a real unknown was how well oaks would regenerate on this site and throughout the region. So we identified this ecosystem in southeastern Wisconsin as being moderately low to moderate in terms of the vulnerability to climate change. And we identified that oak savannas are well adapted to the warmer and the droughtier conditions um, that we are expecting with climate change, but how competitive these, um, these species will be with forest species in the future remains an unknown. <laughs> 
So then we did this carbon trade-off scenario. And I'm just presenting this as something that you might consider um, for, as an activity for yourself when you're trying to think qualitatively about trade-offs and potential co-benefits. So if we start with this plant carbon pool size, um, and we and we have time on the on the x-axis, if our management goal hypothetically was to maximize forest carbon, we might just leave some of these oak savannas to um, move into a music um, full canopy cover forest. We might be maximizing biomass carbon that way, but at the expense of plant biodiversity. And so over time, we would expect plant biodiversity, and this is savanna-dependent um, plant biodiversity, to, to decrease. However, we need to consider climate change, right? And is this system climate adaptive? And it's quite likely that in this low diversity um, music forest that we, if we experience a pest outbreak, that that could really drop our plant carbon pool quite drastically um, without the ability of our plant biodiversity to, to recover. So this scenario doesn't look like a very climate adaptive scenario. So then we thought, what if our management goal um, is to optimize biomass carbon alongside plant biodiversity? So in this case, our plant carbon pool is below the carrying capacity, right? So we're not maximizing, we're just optimizing how much carbon we're trying to hold on that ecosystem, um, on that site. And in turn, we're able to promote a plant bio, savanna dependent plant biodiversity as well. And if we, ex if this uh, site theoretically experiences a similar outbreak, it may be more resilient to resistant and resilient to that pest outbreak um, because it has higher plant biodiversity that's adapted to that specific site. And we might see small losses in both plant carbon and plant biodiversity, but they should be able to um, rebound. And again, this is just a scenario um, we're qualitatively thinking about how these trade-offs may play out over time within a climate adaptation lens. And so um, we have these different patches of land um, within this Meyer Preserve that the Nature Conservancy is managing for where there, these trade-offs may play out in different ways. So there's this really nice um, patch of land that is a pretty um, high functioning oak savanna. And this, the managers decided to leave and manage for oak savanna. So we're going to maintain the carbon stores are there and we're going to try and increase the oak dependent biodiversity at that site. Contrast this with a site that has really already kind of gone over the edge and it's gonna really be hard to bring it back and make it look like an oak savanna. And so this might be a place where we really prioritize carbon goals and we manage it for a music forest increasing carbon, but of course we're gonna lose um, any potential for oak um, abundance and oak dependent um, savanna biodiversity. And here's an oak woodland um, where there's a bunch of woody invasive species that need to be thinned out. Um, we need to decrease canopy cover a little bit, which might slightly decrease our carbon on that um, um, at that unit, but with the hopes of increasing understory biodiversity. And finally, there's sort of this big unknown of a site that um, has some oak death. It's not quite sure um, how prevalent that's going to be and what the ramifications are into the future. Um, and so it's really unknown how um, carbon will look depending on how climate resilient this, um, this patch of land um, can be into the future. But the hope is to manage this as well for oak woodland. So I'm just gonna end by um, presenting some Forest Service guidance on carbon stewardship, which I think is a useful way for us to think about how do you manage for carbon alongside other management goals um, while considering climate adaptation. And hopefully you can tie some of these concepts back into the material that we talked about earlier in the presentation. So time scale is really important and that some carbon benefits may be immediate, but some may not be realized over many, until many decades. The stability is important of that carbon. So how consider how long carbon will persist in the ecosystem, the mean residence time of that carbon. So if the carbon, um, you know, you build up a lot of above ground biomass carbon one year, and then it all burns the next year, that carbon is released back into the atmosphere and um, hasn't done a lot for climate mitigation. Again, consider climate adaptation. You're all um, thinking about this a lot in these few weeks. Um, not all adaptation actions will provide carbon benefits, but many actions do address risks to ecosystem health that can sustain or improve the capacity of systems to sequester carbon.
And finally, seek to optimize carbon within the context of ecosystem integrity and climate adaptation rather than maximizing carbon at the expense of forest health or habitat. And finally, recognize that carbon is one of multiple management objectives. And so that's all I have for you today. I'd be happy to answer some questions um, and I look forward to the discussion.